This morning, through our scripture reading of both Acts and Romans, we hear this story of Pentecost, and I read it this morning from Eugene Peterson's The Message. I invite you to hear this story of the day of Pentecost, perhaps even with new ears. And you might even want to close your eyes and picture yourself alongside the disciples as you hear these words from Acts 2, verses 1 through 21. When the feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. <clears throat> then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. Then when they heard one after another their own mother tongues being spoken, they were thunderstruck. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on and kept saying, aren't these all Galileans? How come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites. Visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of the Libya belonging to Cyrene, immigrants from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, even Cretans and Arabs. They're speaking our language, describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused. What's going on here? And then from Romans 8, verse 14 through 18. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant. Greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? God's Spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who He is, and we know who we are, Father and children. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through, and if we go through the hard times with Him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him as well. This is God's holy word for us on this holy day. This morning, as we place ourselves in the midst of a Pentecost feast, I share with you Two readings, both excerpts from Dirt, Mess, and Danger by Glendon Macaulay. I invite you to put yourself there, in that place. Gathered with the now 12 again disciples and many others crowding into the room. Jesus had told them to be here, to wait in Jerusalem, wait until ten days had passed after you had stood there staring up at the sky as Jesus ascended up into the heavens. So you waited. You did what the Lord had said. Now you wait for Christ's promise to unfold. A noise that sounded like a strong wind blowing. But that's not to say there was a strong wind blowing that day. They saw what looked like tongues of fire. But that's not to say there were flames burning brightly that day. These were the nearest words that they could find to describe their strange experience. They had to scramble and feel around to find a way of communicating 
what they had encountered, for it left them amazed and confused. And so they kept on asking each other, what's going on here? But little wonder they chose to speak about it in terms of the wind. For there is a huge power in the wind, strong enough to lift the roofs off of houses, strong enough to capsize winds and capsize ships at sea, strong enough to blow down trees a hundred feet tall. The power of the wind, the power of the Holy Spirit of God in the people of God, causing lives to be turned inside out and upside down, upsetting long-standing arrangements and traditional habits, sweeping away deep prejudices and greed and self-centeredness and putting justice and fairness and equality in their place. Little wonder, when they came face to face with the power of God that day, they likened it to the power of the wind. There is a gradual coaxing of the wind, nudging plants so they grow at an awkward angle, eroding rock faces, particularly sandstone, until they take on a different shape causing sailing boats to follow a particular path and be led along the wind's path. The gradual coaxing of the wind, the gradual coaxing of the Holy Spirit of God in the people of God, amending and reshaping individuals so they do their thinking in a different kind of way, wearing down what is unhelpful and rough until the face of love is recognized and more obviously seen. Provoking thoughts and suggesting and pointing folk heavenwards until they are convinced a more Christ-like method, a more God-like way, is what's best for the sake of this world. Little wonder when they came face to face with the coaxing of God that day, they likened it to the coaxing of the wind. There is the destructive capacity of the wind, breaking great suspension bridges in two, driving floodwaters to places they have no business being, bringing down aircraft as they make their innocent journeys across the sky, smashing up crops and until there is nothing left to eat. The destructive capacity of the wind, the destructive capacity of the Holy Spirit of God in the people of God, dismantling rigid, brittle opinion and tunnel vision, rooting out darkness and badness and hate, demolishing and proud ego and self-importance and self-centeredness, crushing arrogance and high-handedness and nasty words. Little wonder when they came face to face with the destructive capacity of God that day, they likened it to the destructive capacity of the wind. But there's also the creative ability of the wind, picking up dandelion seeds and transporting them so new life take root, cooling down the atmosphere so living is more possible under a baking, boiling sun, shifting mountain loads of sand in the desert to create new contours and adding variety to the planet Earth, drying up the heavy rain so crops might grow and flourish and people can eat and their bellies are filled and their hunger is satisfied. The creative ability of the wind, the creative ability of the Holy Spirit of God, in the people of God, inspiring sacrifice and goodwill and generosity, 
planting seeds of compassion and of mercy, enabling gentleness to be born again and willingly shared, moving mountains of prejudice so that beauty and tenderness can breathe and thrive, tidying up the rubbish and debris which exists inside us, washing us clean, making us whole. Little wonder when they came face to face with the creative ability of God that day, they likened it to the creative ability of the wind. Amazed and confused, they kept on asking each other, what's going on here? Amazed and confused, they could only attempt to find appropriate words to explain their encounter with the God Spirit. And so, little wonder they spoke about it in terms of the wind. But little wonder, too, they spoke about it in the terms of the fire that burns. For a fire can be a life force. A fire's heat has the capacity to change many things. Warmth sustains and encourages growth. Flames cheer and hearten, and their lively movements restore and revive. The life-giving fire, the life-giving Holy Spirit of God for the people of God, renewing body and soul and renewing our spirit when our mood is low. Showing new purpose and providing fresh meaning. Guiding our choices when decisions are difficult and crowd, crossroads confusing. Pointing to the future, establishing hope and the promise of the heavens. Little wonder when they came face to face with the life force of God that day, they likened it to the flames of a fire that burns. But like the wind, a fire can also destroy. Solid rocks are melted into liquid. Great forests are scorched and history turned to ash. Proud structures are demolished, reduced to no more than rubble. Possessions gathered disappear, no longer able to be owned or enjoyed. The fire that destroys the contradictory destructive forces of the Holy Spirit of God for the people of God, melting, molding, transforming stony hearts until graciousness and gentleness becomes the new response. Old ways of living were wiped out, vaporized, leaving space for the new way of doing things. Little wonder then that when they came face to face with the terrible, destructive force of God that day, they likened it to the fire that fiercely burns. But a fire that burns gives light. It is a beacon on a hilltop. It is a torch to light a path. A candle flame that stands as a symbol a brightness when all around is cold and dark. The light producing fire, the light producing Holy Spirit of God in and for the people of God, indicating the good way through the maze and the mess that living can burn brightly. God's goodness as an ever-present option, a possibility.
responsibility. Like an internal flame amid hopelessness and despair. Demonstrating divinity about a stubborn humanity which relies on itself. Little wonder when they came face to face with the light of God that day, they likened it to the light of a fire that burns and burns. Amazed and confused, they kept asking, what's going on here? They did well to speak about God in terms of wind, for the power and the coaxing and the creating of that Pentecost spirit is very well known to people like you and me. They did well to speak about God in terms of fire. For the life-giving, life-changing, light-producing force of that Pentecost spirit can become very well known to people like you and me. It was almost too much to take in, too mind-blowing for them to understand, too big for human minds to process. Yes, there were some who said it was like a raging fire. Others compared it to that unstoppable gale force of the wind. Some discovered it in the fulfillment they had longed for. And there were those for whom it was an explosive, technicolor extravaganza, like fireworks in the night. The disciples came, they gathered just as Jesus had said. They came, and since then, nothing has ever been the same. The day everything changed. You have a whole lot to answer for, God's Spirit. For the result was an extraordinary experience. Excitement and unprecedented disturbance. As well as soothing and calming and peace. But doves don't change lives. So if we have become apathetic and complacent and over-relaxed and easy, let us understand the Spirit's presence as the restless wind of adventure. Fireworks don't change lives either. If we have become fascinated by the outward trappings and impressive rituals and carefully choreographed formalities of organized religion, let us understand the Spirit's presence as fire. Fire that melts and molds, that reshapes and refines, that stirs up energy and cuts to the core and reaches the heart and the center of our being. In the quietness now, we listen to your powerful God spirit. In the quietness now, work your work in us for our own sake and yours. Within your bulletin is a smaller insert with the hymn words to spirit now live in I invite you to hang on to that as we are going to sing in just a minute the first verse I'm going to share with you, and then we'll continue to sing the verses in the midst of our message. I'm going to invite the ladies to play it one time through first so you become familiar with the tune.
it, but have discovered that they are unwelcome and unwanted. There are those who thought they would be fed, but whose bellies still gnaw with terrible hunger. There are those who were promised equal treatment, but have discovered there are more important agendas to be met. Great Spirit, listen again to the dreaming of your people. Mend their hurting, mend the injustice, mend the unfairness and greed, and let that happen because you live in each of us. Verse 2.